So, Tim, uh, it's too bad that we, we, we can't welcome you uh, physically okay. uh, at China ICT. But uh, thank you so much for staying up so late because it's uh, 4.15 right now. You're in Paris. It's 4.15 a.m. You told me, Frank, I don't want to change the time slot. I respect my commitment to you. I'll be there at 10 a.m. So you're here. It's incredible. So all the rooms see you in a big, big, big format. You can watch that on leseco.fr uh, to see how, how you look. And uh, so it's very, very, very late for you. Um, I'm pretty sure you won't have too many difficulties to understand my French accent, since you are used to, to being in France quite a lot. No, I, I have no trouble because I've been in Paris for, uh, for about four, four days, and I have no trouble understanding French accent. And don't worry, I actually, I actually uh, had a, another video conference call. Um, I spoke to another group on Skype about uh, about an hour ago. So I, um, I'm, I'm awake. <laughs> okay, okay, that's fantastic. Um, so um, I'm really delighted, delighted to, to welcome you uh, because you, 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 you're probably one of the most uh, prominent venture capitalists in the world, not only in Silicon Valley and Europe, but also in China. We'll talk about that uh, uh, later during this interview. Um, I understand that you're coming from a very long tradition of uh, venture capitalists in your family, right? Yes. Yes, my grandfather was the first venture capitalist uh, in the Silicon Valley. Wow. And my father, uh, my and he started something called Draper, Gaither, and Anderson. And then uh, my father um, was also a great venture capitalist, and he uh, he started. Uh, a, a, he, he actually was uh, the first, I believe, the first venture capitalist that that used the uh, the LPGP relationship. In fact, oh, now that you mention it. Here, here's my pre-roll. This is my dad's book. Wow. Oh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yes. I, I, my I, father wrote it, and, and it's getting translated into Chinese. And um, this particular book is in English, and it was written by uh, Eric Schmidt. And, I, I mean, I'm sorry, the foreword was written by Eric Schmidt, but the foreword in the Chinese version, of course, is going to be written by Robin Lee. Wow! So it should be, uh, it should be a great, great seller there in China. You know that we had a uh, Hayushan uh, um, Robin Lee uh, right hand yesterday at China City. Oh, he's a wonderful man. I, I've, I've enjoyed meeting him too. Um, you know, uh, I, I should tell you why I'm not there and why I'm in Paris. Um, Paris, uh, the president of Paris, uh, president of France. Uh, Sarkozy uh, invited me to come to uh, the G8, the, the EG8, to discuss internet for the G8 governments. And one of the things that was constantly running in my mind is why? Why does the G8 not include China? That was one of the things that was was very confusing for makes me. Makes no sense. And uh, it, it makes no sense. China is the second largest uh, economy of the world, and should always be a part of any kinds of decisions that the, that group is making. But the other thing I thought about was um, the, the sense I got was that they, the governments are trying to uh, figure out how to put controls on the Internet where I'm looking and I'm saying the best governments are the ones who kind of let it rip and watch all these entrepreneurs do these extraordinary things with the internet. And, uh, and I think that governments are going to have to compete with one another for the great entrepreneurs, for the great minds, and the great capital. And uh, I know China is doing a very good job of this right now, and the more open that China stays, the, the better, I think. Um, but I, anyway, that was, a, that was one of the things that came out of the conference. It was a, a lot of great people there, and, uh, and I'm very sorry that I'm not in China with all the great entrepreneurs and great, great excitement that goes on there. Um, I, I miss being there, although I'm enjoying French food and, uh, and eating very well. Okay, well, I'm happy for that, and, and uh, I'm sure we'll have you uh, next year um, in person here at, at Chennai City. Uh, 
since uh, next year, well, I mean, it's still kind of unclear if uh, the president of Paris, as you called him, uh, will still be uh, in, um, in his position. We don't know at this stage. Uh, you never know. We never know. Uh, I, I have, um, you know, I, I used to be, as you know, a, a software entrepreneur myself, and after I sold my company to Oracle, I, I came to China to for another adventure, and I can tell you that it's definitely an adventure. I wanted adventures. This is adventure, real adventure, real thing. Um, but many, many highly, many highly successful entrepreneurs have, um, after they sold their, their, their company, they started to uh, either to join an existing venture capital firm or to start their own. Do you think that they have the right mindset and the right qualities to be a great venture capitalist? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think the best venture capitalists are, uh, are have some entrepreneurial uh, spirit in them. And so I think if uh, entrepreneurs want to, who become very successful, want to then put that money to work and invest in other entrepreneurs, they can be very good at that. Uh, it, it's a little bit, th th though, uh, my one word of warning is some entrepreneurs have run their business by controlling every everything that goes on in their business mm -hmm. and when they fund entrepreneurs they've got to they've got to have a very light touch and they have to encourage the entrepreneur to run their own vision uh, not the vision of the venture capitalist um, it's a little like uh, my recommendations to governments to to have a light touch not a not a heavy touch just let it let it let it do its natural run its natural course um, and just advise when you think you can be really, really helpful. Um, you know, I've got to, I got to tell you another story, just if you don't mind. We, um, you know, I do travel around a lot, but but this was uh, Tony Perkins asked me to be at a conference uh, way back in nineteen, what was it, ninety six or something, and. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll be there. And then, um, and, and then uh, Nicholas Zenstrom said, uh, we're going to have our first Skype board meeting in Tallinn at the same time. And I thought, oh, no, how can I be in two places at once? I promised this, and I really have to go to this board meeting. So I went back to Tony, and I said, I've got to be at this uh, this board meeting, uh, is there some way we can do one of these video conferences? And at that time, video conferences were very shaky at best. Yeah. And he said, sure, but can you get Nicholas to be on the, on the video too? I hear Skype's doing really well. And I said, yeah, yeah, we'll do the interview. And I went to Nicholas and I said, will you do it? And he said, sure. Um, and then Nicholas said to me, well, we've been working on something in the lab you know, at that time, Skype was just the audio service. So we've been working on something in the lab. Go ahead. Um, and, and I think we've, we've got it so that we can probably do the video conference on Skype. And I said, what? There was no alpha, no beta. It was just lab work. And he said, no, I think it's going to work out okay. And so just before we went on, he said, okay, throw the switch. And I said, what switch? And he goes, oh, we're basically cutting all the bandwidth of all the phone calls that are going out on Skype right now so that all the bandwidth could go into our video conference. And, um, and it turned out it was a beautifully done video conference. We had incredible bandwidth. And, uh, and there was somebody from eBay and somebody from Microsoft in the audience. And uh, eventually, the eBay thing led to the eBay acquisition. I don't know if the Microsoft guy led to the Microsoft acquisition, but maybe over the long haul it did. Um, so, so doing this by video conference is, is great fun for me because uh, I've got a, I've got a wonderful uh, history of being some of the, being in some of the first video conference calls. You know, it's funny you mentioned Niklas Zenstrom, the founder of Skype, because uh, he, he was he was uh, in Beijing a few months ago and uh, he wanted to, to be at China City this year, but uh, he had accepted a previous commitment at the very same time in Istanbul and he's in Istanbul right now for the NASPERS internal conference. Anyway, um, but I, I haven't thought at that time to, to, to ask him to do a Skype conference. I should have, because it's not so bad. The, the results is, is actually uh, pretty convincing. Um, 
Many, many years ago, Tim, you started, uh, you were the first, um, to my knowledge, to start exporting the Silicon Valley style um, culture of investing when most of them, when all at that time, all the, the venture capitalists uh, from Silicon Valley at the time were still thinking that they could find only good deals 17 miles away from their offices. Uh, you basically started to travel all around the world, in China, in Europe, uh, um, preaching, preaching, uh, the, the, the word is right, preaching, evangelizing about uh, the, the, the way of investing in Silicon Valley. And this has brought your company tremendous, huge successes. One of them is Skype, you already mentioned. The other one in China is, is Baidu. Um, I was wondering, why so few VCs, even today from Silicon Valley, have been, why, uh, have been following your, 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 foot, your footsteps? Why? Well, I think I was lucky. Um, I was lucky because of a couple of things. One is um, about 30 years ago, no, maybe it's 25 years ago, uh, my father brought me to China. He was with the UN Development Program. Mm -hmm. And I saw the country as it was um, 25 years ago. We, we drove in the only car on the only paved road to the only Americanized hotel, then it was called the Friendship Hotel, I think it's still around. A famous place, famous place, um, yes, yeah. And then about uh, 15 years later, I came back to China. Um, I wasn't afraid to travel because I did travel a lot when I was younger. Um, I came back to China and I saw, um, I, I took a, a trip from uh, Shanghai to Hangzhou and it was about a three hour drive and it was a little boring. And I was looking out the window, you know, staring at these, every single house was a two-story concrete tilt-up. And they all looked exactly the same. And then I saw one with blue windows and a spire and a, and a nice driveway. And then I, I went a little further and I saw another one, blue windows, spire, driveway. And then I saw a, a one street that had about four houses with blue windows, four spires, and driveways that are all interconnected. <clears throat> and I thought, well, this is really interesting because it's, um, it's a little like the 1950s in the United States, when, like keeping up with the Joneses. If your neighbor buys a refrigerator, you've got to have a refrigerator. Uh, if neighbor buys a color TV, you have to have a color TV. And, uh, and now, you know, of course, if your neighbor buys the internet, you've got to have the internet. And uh, somebody has a cell phone, you've got to have a cell phone. So um, I, um, I looked at that and I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting time. And I went and I talked to some people who had invested money in China before. And one guy started a chocolate company and he built it to 90 million in revenues and it then was nationalized and he lost the whole thing. And I thought, well, maybe things will change. And I got a chance to talk to a few of the uh, ministers mm -hmm. and I said, you know, you really should um, let people make some money in China because uh, a lot more will come. And, uh, and he sort of took that to heart and I, I, I didn't think anything of it, but then um, we had set up offices in a number of different uh, uh, cities around the United States. And those, those were all doing quite well. And it, and it was working very well. It was um, not just that I was seeing a lot more interesting investment opportunities, but I could also uh, uh, have each of them um, talk to each other and we'd have best practices and we'd make introductions for each other and uh, things really started to work well and we called it the TFJ network. Um, and so when there was a, an opportunity to do um, a, a fund, and this was 1998 or 99, to do an international fund, we felt like that was a great opportunity for us and, uh, and we did the fund and uh, started investing. And the first few investments we made were in people who said they had very good government connections. And it turned out we lost all our money in those. Uh, and then we thought, well, what do we really do well? Well, we invest in young, driven, exciting 
dynamic entrepreneurs who, who really want to change the way the uh, the world operates, and. Uh, and so we started to do that, and that's where we found uh, Kong Zhang and Focus Media and and Baidu, uh, and so uh, then we, uh, you know, it was it was a wonderful experience uh, to work with young entrepreneurs from uh, from not just other parts of the United States but other countries, and uh, China was very unique in this way that um, most. Most of these entrepreneurial groups, uh, I mean, most of the venture capital groups that we set up uh, worked very well. They, they funded companies that were all very local, but those local companies would get special treatment from their local uh, customers. Mm -hmm. they would, their local customers would prefer them because they were nearby. Well, the same thing was true of China. But China had a billion people, and so some of these companies would be would get some preferential treatment, but they would get it in a very large customer base, and so very big companies could start here in China and get get that leg up that they needed with their customers. And now I think it's um, a, a major opportunity for Chinese companies to start um, testing their new technologies in the world outside of China. And uh, and we've had quite a few of our startups actually do that, and it's working quite well. Okay, um, um, what you were mentioning Baidu, uh, so, so you were very, very, I don't know, maybe the first, um, if I'm not mistaken, investor in Baidu, so you, you invested very, very early on uh, in Baidu. Baidu, uh, for the, the people who are following us uh, online, the Western people who might not know, it's uh, uh, the number one search engine uh, in China with 80% uh, market share. Uh, it's one of Chinese city partners. Uh, we had the number two of Baidu yesterday at uh, at China City. So, uh, what was uh, what what drove you basically to invest in Baidu at the time when you met Robin Lee? What was the the spark? Let's say, wow, this guy rocks. I need. What happened? Well, he he was. He he had a lot. It's interesting. Uh, he and uh, Nicholas Zenstrom actually have similar some similar characteristics. They are they are steady and very very consistent. Um, you you when you are with them, you feel great confidence in their ability to execute well. They um, they have the ability to attract people to their vision. Uh, which turns out to be a very important uh, characteristic. Uh, charisma or the or the magnet magnetism is very important for these people, so that uh, so that they can talk about um, kind of moving an idea forward, and and a lot of people will really want to join them and listen and uh, and and help make that vision a reality. Uh, he also had. Uh, at that time, um, developed one of the leading search tools and some very good technology for search uh, in China. And uh, we had done some research. Uh, we had done, we had made six investments in search engines in the U.S. before Google ever got started. Uh, so we were way ahead on the on the search uh, in the search world. And so we had an opportunity to uh, study the search world in China, and uh, and then when we met Robin, the, the decision was made right off. Uh, we uh, we were very happy working with him. He uh, he had some incredible. He also had some personal confidence that uh, that is uh, you know catching. It makes you feel confident because you see how confident he is. Um, and then, then we had a great time. Robin and I had a great time. We talked about what all the various search business models were in the U.S. Mm -hmm. so that he could then put Chinese characteristics around the search uh, tool and figure out what, what his search tool ideally would look like. And, um, and so, as you know, I do looks very different from Google. It looked at that time looked very different from Ask Jeeves, from 
uh, from all the other search engines in the world. And, uh, and so we had a lot of fun talking about that. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, when we funded them, we, we felt like we were paying a very high price for it, but uh, sometimes you have to pay up for quality. That's for sure. It turned out to be a low. Turned out to be a low price. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it, it probably turned turns out to be the best uh, invest investment decision you ever taken in your life, right? Uh, yeah, one of the top three. One of the top three. And, I, and probably the best. It probably is the best. Probably um, the best. Wow. Interestingly, uh, there was a company called Parametric Technology that uh, that grew from a very little seed way back when, when I, and it was right when I got started. Uh, and that company actually uh, made a very large multiple on the, um, on the investment too, as well as, but I do, yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I thank Robin Lee for all of his hard work. Uh, Uh, we we really appreciate everything he's done. Tim, you were mentioning earlier that Chinese companies now should start competing internationally. Uh, do you think they have what it takes to compete internationally? I mean, many times, especially from the from the U.S., because the voice coming from Europe is kind of a, <clears throat> uh, um, broken sometimes. But from the U.S., I mean, the, the the voice is pretty strong, and there's a. Uh, plenty of people who say that there's no tech innovation in China. Do you think that uh, the Chinese companies have what it takes to, to, to compete internationally? Oh boy, yeah, they sure do. Um, <laughs> I do remember uh, there were some comments when, uh, when, when America broke off from England and, uh, and America... Uh, Interestingly, I'm, I may be uh, moving this. I'm running a little bit low on power. Um, in fact, I'll, I'm going to pick this up just a second. Okay, no problem. Excuse me. This won't take... Hang on. Nice tie, nice tie, okay. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so, so uh, <laughs> where were we? Um, The uh, hang on, it's early in the morning here. What what, what were we talking about? <laughs> American broke off in the UK. Okay, it's good to know. Oh yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so so here's the here's the situation. America broke off from the UK, and and the, in the UK they said they said oh those Americans they're very good at manufacturing but they really don't understand the, the real sense of, of how innovation happens um, I think sometimes Americans are saying the same thing about China uh, but when I go back to China I see the most innovative companies um, now I'm in the Silicon Valley and the state of the art is really driven very much by it continues to be driven by the Silicon Valley but I am seeing things in China that the Silicon Valley doesn't isn't even dreaming of and I think it has to do with um, success leading to more confidence which then leads to more success and more innovation so if you're successful one time with your uh, with your company um, Then, uh, then you look and you say, well, you know, what else can we do? And then it's um, so that, like, in the U.S., they might be saying, you know, why don't we try uh, electric vehicles that are self-navigated? In China, they might be saying, well, let's think about how about self-navigating flying electric vehicle. And I think that's because there's this confidence. It's, if you feel good and you feel confident about yourself, You can try some things that are a little bit more outrageous. You are willing to take the risk of failing. And, uh, and if you are willing to fail, if, you, if you're willing to do something that has a, a very big chance of failure, uh, you, can, you can really innovate. You can really try things that no one else has tried. And uh, I think that's happening in China now. Okay. Um... One, one last uh, question. Uh, which product or which company 
would you recommend a very close member of your family? I, I know that some of your children are, are entrepreneurs, by the way. But um, would you recommend a close member of your family to create now in order to get a, a nice exit uh, on a short-term basis or short or mid-term basis? Yeah, well, that's really fun to think about because uh, I, I already have two children in the work world. One of them is uh, Jessie Draper. She's the Valley Girl. She uh, she interviews great entrepreneurs, and uh, and she does fun things with them. She she uh, does it does it all dressed in pink. Everything's pink, and and she says she's going to change the the turn the world pink one company at a time. But she uh, she interviewed Ted Turner, and and she they they sang together, and they did a high five, and then with the Node Co. Tesla, who does green technology, she got him to paint her green. Um, she did uh, a great, very funny video called "Can't Tweet This" with uh, MC Hammer, and uh, and so she is just hilarious and doing. You know, she's on her own doing her own thing. I I think I would not recommend that that direction for anyone, but she is. Um, I think she's actually going to make it big as as sort of a, a you know a character Valley Girl uh, interviewer. Um, this the uh, the other thing I, I'll tell you is that my son Adam I did advise uh, to get involved in something called Expert Financial, mm -hmm. and what that is is um, in the U.S. Uh, we were having a lot of trouble with Sarbanes Oxley because it's a it's a, a set of laws that were made for very, very large companies, and small companies are, um, are really getting hurt by it. And so smaller companies don't ever want to go public. And for lots of reasons now, I don't want to go, I don't want to be on the board of a public company. And, and not many uh, people do. Uh, public companies have too much liability and too many problems and shareholder lawsuits and whatever. So anyway, um, Expert Financial set up a, a, an opportunity to do a private IPO called an XPO. And so a company can take their company um, out. They can raise money, uh, know who all their shareholders are, um, and only work with uh, the high net worth individuals and qualified institutions so that they don't have to deal with some of the things these public companies have to deal with. And uh, and so I would, I mean, I did recommend for my son to go into that direction. Uh, I think I think if I were to advise um, my kids, and I will continue to, um, I would say go after things that uh, where, where there's an incumbent who is uh, really um, kind of a monopoly and the customer is not satisfied. And, uh, and I think of Hotmail this way, there, the incumbent was the post office and the customer was not happy and the incumbent was a monopoly and uh, the customer, uh, and, and so when Hotmail came along, it just um, it really obliterated the need for, for people writing letters and putting them in envelopes and sending them overseas. Mm -hmm. We can just uh, now quickly email to each other through, uh, through web-based email. So um, I would generally say go after uh, entrenched incumbents who are um, where customers are not happy. Um, I think the same thing's true of the phone company when Skype came along. People were just unhappy. They, they were paying too much for overseas calls, and they weren't uh, able to communicate nearly as much as they can now. And, uh, so I think that's it. I think uh, go after uh, some sort of a, you could call it a revolution or a, a, a Shake up, or go for something that's a little different from what's going on now. Because you're young, and you can do things like like that when you're young, and you can fail six times before you need to succeed. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tim. It was very, very interesting. Um, many, many, uh, a few people, uh, just few people know that uh, you're also a, a songwriter, and I know that uh, you wrote a VC <laughs> song. So. I don't know if I may ask you to maybe to sing a little bit of, of that to, to, to conclude. I, 
I would be happy to. But as you know, I'm going to Almost have to sing 5 a.m. in France. Look at that. It's incredible. I, I, don't, I don't want to wake up everybody in Paris. So, uh, so I will sing uh, a few, few versions of the wrist, or a few uh, terms of the wrist master. I wrote this song because um, I had an opportunity to write a song that, uh, that a very big uh, hit songwriter um, would, would work with me on. And so I wrote the lyrics and he wrote the music. And the first thing that happened was he, I wrote the lyrics and he wrote back and he said, I can't, I can't sing anything to the tune of, to the tune of entrepreneur. And so I turned it into this song called The Wrist Master. And uh, so here, here you go. Invested all his mattress money. Divorced his prom queen, hometown honey. Scraping up his alimony. Friends think he's a little funny. Needs a world-class CEO. Just another million or so. Get him to some real cash flow. So tears and sweat can IPO. For 15 years, he's been outgunned. Bankers demanding a blood refund. Companies looking more abund. Even Draper will not fund. He is the risk master. Lives fast and drives faster. Skates on the edge of disaster. He is the risk master. And then it goes on to uh, where he, he makes himself a success. The salesman says, says we've got it. Company's gonna show a profit. And then the last verse is, he, he, everyone sees it, it's clear, uh, his vision is unfurled, and, uh, and now everybody wants a piece of his hide. And so that's kind of the that's kind of the fun and the irony of the song. And, um, and it's big hit, you can get it on wherever, iTunes, my, my blog, you can go to my blog. <laughs> Fantastic song. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank uh, you, Craig. Thank you. So, have a sweet dreams. I don't want to take more of your of your sleeping time. Have sweet dreams, and uh, hopefully, we we'll welcome you in person next year at China City. Good. I sure hope we can do that. That would be great fun. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. <clears throat> bye bye.